All right, so um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about macromolecules or um, section 3.2 um, and the carbon structures as well as um, condensation reactions and hydrolysis reactions. Um, but let me just provide you a little bit of background about carbon and why carbon is quite why carbon is so important, and then we'll talk about dehydration and condensation reactions as they apply to carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. So these notes are meant to supplement the other podcasts that are specifically about the carbs, lipids, and proteins. Um, and before I say that, I know that this is a little different format. This is the PowerPoint that I'm going to talk over, um, and this is a PowerPoint that. Um, honestly, I can't remember the source of. I got um, probably when I was in graduate school. Um, so there's some extra detail in this, and um, that's not a bad thing. So let's go ahead and get started and see what we can make sense of. So what you need to know is that carbon atoms can easily bond to several other carbon atoms in a chain or a ring to form macromolecules. Cells can make a variety of macromolecules from a small set of monomers or building blocks, and um, you need to be able to identify and describe the following macromolecules in their structure. Carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, which we're going to learn about um, soon in this unit. So you need to know that carbs provide and store energy, lipids insulate um, and store energy, and they also make up cell membranes. Um, and you need to know that proteins may be structural or function in transport, movement, defense, or cell regulation. And nucleic acids, which is the two examples that we know of, that we talk about, um, is DNA and RNA. Um, and they are... They control cell activities by directing protein synthesis. So they carry the instructions by which we make proteins. And we're going to learn more about that process um, next. So you need to be able to give examples of each specific protein function. Recognize that proteins are polymers made, up, made by linking together amino acid monomers. And recognize that protein structure depends on its specific conformation. You also need to know that um, enzymes have a general structure and function, and most organisms tolerate only small changes in pH and temperature. Now, those are other things that you need to know from other videos and other sections of the book. I'm not actually going to get into that today, or right now. So when we're talking about composition of living things, we need to understand the content, the context in which we're talking about. 70%, about 70%, rather, of all living things are made up of water. So we, it's important that we understand the properties of water, the polar nature of water, the hydrogen bonding that water can make, in order to understand the, the chemical properties of all these other molecules that exist in this aqueous solution. But we've talked about that already. And we already know that it's a covalently bonded inorganic molecule because it's H2O. There's no carbon. And when we focus in on the 30% that of, um, of the other substances, 95% of them are carbon-containing compounds, organic materials. 5% of that section is minerals and vitam vitamins and those kinds of things. Carbon is responsible for what we call organic things. Think organism. Um, and, and carbon forms the structural and functional components of all organisms. And that we're, that's what we're getting ready to talk about. So carbon cycle is something we'll come back to when we talk about ecology at the end of the year. But carbon is the quote unquote living stuff of organisms. Carbon itself is not alive, it's just an atom. But it's what we, um, we're looking for carbon compounds when we eat. And that's what we digest and break down. And when we, when we decompose, it's all about the carbon. So this creates a carbon cycle. So when you eat food, you die, you decompose. Um, and basically, all those carbon atoms cycle through the environment. So the same carbon atoms in your body today have been in, used in countless other molecules since time began. So it might be the same carbon atoms that were used in dinosaurs and your ancestors. Um, they just get recycled over and over again. So this is just a, a foresh um, yeah, foreshadowing the carbon cycle when we talk about it. Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, we talk about it, and it goes through this system with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, going through photosynthesis in the trees. There's actually an arrow missing because plants do cellular respiration and throw that back into the atmosphere as well. Or they get consumed and they go through a food chain or food web each component giving off cellular respiration, doing cellular respiration, giving off carbon dioxide, or decay happening where the bacteria will then um, go through cellular respiration and kick carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Or these things will build up and become fossil fuels. Those fossil fuels then get burned through combustion and put back into the atmosphere by humans. So this is essentially the carbon cycle. But when we're talking about certain nutrients, we're, what we're focusing in here is from plants to animals and from animal to animal. And um, 
Uh, here's a little cartoon for your enjoyment. All right, so why is carbon so central to life? It's because it has four valence electrons. And because it has four valence electrons, it's seeking four other valence electrons. And when doing so, it actually is able to create four bonds on all sides, uh, or can be on all sides, which allows for long chains and rings to form, um, giving us the structural components that are so important to life. Um, so here are the four, four representations of molecules. You need to be able to recognize these from a diagram like this. So here's our carbohydrate. You would recognize this from the other podcast. You've got a ring of carbons. Um, how many carbons do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is glucose or some kind of isomer of glucose, but notice that there's a string of them. They're all connected here and here. So it's a string of glucose molecules. So this is not a monosaccharide or a disaccharide. In fact, we see three of them extending onto a fourth one. So this would be a polysaccharide. We've got our lipid, which are with our hydrocarbon chain, a long chain of carbons with hydrogens on either side. We've got our carboxyl group over here. We've got a protein over here. Here's the NCC backbone that I mentioned in the other podcast. NCC, NCC, NCC. It repeats over and over and over again. And here's the R group. This is that residue group. This R group is a little different than this R group and, um, and this R group. So these three different R groups make three different amino acids, but when those amino acids come together, we get the polymer that we call a protein or a polypeptide. Here we've got nucleic acid, which um, you may see some nitrogens. You see a sugar or a carbohydrate right here. There's a phosphate group up here as well. we'll and here's one for the, for the, nucle the nucleic acid or nucleotide just below. Um, but we'll talk more about that soon. So carbon can have three different kinds of bonding patterns, single bonds, double bonds, or triple bonds. Um, when it's a single bond, it can make this chain and bond to four different atoms on all sides. With a double bond, it's going to be able to make a tighter connection between two carbon atoms, but still have the ability to make two more connections on either side. And a triple bond is the most stable, but it creates um, one, bond, one, other, one additional bond on either side. So other atoms can then branch off of that carbon when it has those four um, components. So here are a couple functional groups that you need to be able to identify. We've got hydroxyl groups, OH groups. These offer some kind of polarity, um, a little bit of polarity, which makes them hydrophilic, um, bonding with water. <clears throat> Think back to the Pogol that we did. Here's We've got carboxyl groups, which are right here. We've got an amino group, which we've got the NCC. Um, here's our carboxyl group, and here is the R group, um, and here's an amino group. So things are a little misaligned here, but these are R groups. We've got our carboxyl group. Here's a phosphate group. Um, it's labeled over here, but there's the phosphate group. All right, so we need to talk about polymerization. And we're building now to condensation reactions, what IB calls condensation reactions. So polymerization is the building of a bigger molecule by making a polymer. And a polymer is a large molecule built, built by repeating smaller subunits. Um, and molecules are often polymers. We call these things macromolecules. So they're basically, I think of them as lots and lots of, of the same kind of Lego piece put together. So if you look at this diagram on the bottom, we've got um, a, a carbohydrate that's linked here by this bond right here to another carbohydrate, which is linked to another carbohydrate, which is linked to another carbohydrate. And this can go on for, for a long, long time. This is a polymer. But if we looked at one of these things that's, um, that's background in black, that is a single monomer. But they're all connected, so we can't say we've got a single monomer. So a monomer is a building block. Here's a model of one. This blue stuff can represent whatever is in the middle of a monomer. So carbs are made out of one kind of monomer. Um, lipids are made out of another kind. Proteins are made out of another kind. But on either end of the monomer, we're going to have a hydrogen group on one side and a, hyd um, and a hydroxyl group on the other, an OH. So that's a monomer. But if we take two monomers together, <clears throat> the way that they combine is that we're going to take away a hydrogen from one side and an OH from the other side. And what we get out is water. So another word for polymerization reactions is dehydration reactions. We're pulling water out. We're dehydrating this molecule. We're taking water out, and, and yet another word is a condensation reaction because when you condense something, you put it together. 
So sometimes it's called a dehydration reaction, a synthesis reaction, a condensation reaction, or a polymerization reaction. But what we end up with, with two, from two monitors bonded together, we end up with a water molecule plus what we call a dimer. It's got two parts to it, two monomers. So a condensation reaction, um, here's another example. We've got a, um, <clears throat> this, is, this is a glycerol molecule, and this is the carboxyl group end of a fatty acid. So this H and these o, this OH come off to make H2O. So this is actually going to happen three times right here, right here, and right here to make a fat molecule. So when a fat molecule is made out of one glycerol and three fatty acids, we actually get three water molecules that pop out. So here's our dimer. Again, our generic model. We add another monomer and we're going to take out water molecule again. And what we end up with is now another dehydration reaction. And if this continues over and over and over again, now we've got hundreds of these molecules long, then we've got what we call a polymer. Um, so this could be um, the starch, the glycogen, the cellulose. It could be fat molecules. It can be proteins. But it's the same process in all of them. Hydrolysis reactions are the exact opposite. If we take a fat molecule and add water to it, Remember, fat is hydrophobic, so it won't interact with water unless it's got a, <clears throat> excuse me, an enzyme, for example, lipase, that's going to break down this lipid. But dimers or polymers are broken apart by hydrolysis. Hydro means water, lysis means to break. So it uses water to break that apart. So we've got our polymer. If we add water to this, um, that dimer breaks apart. And we've now, and we've got this oxygen that was here, it's still here over here, and we've added an H, and then another H, and an O. That's where our H2O went, so this water broke apart. Here's another reaction. I hope you can figure out what kind of molecule this is. The molecule this, is. this is NCC, 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 NCC. We've got an R in here. Even though that R should actually be a branch with the more atoms on it, that's the variable group or the residue group. Um, so you should know... You should have figured out that this is a protein. If we add water to that protein, that protein breaks up into individual amino acids. We've learned about this process. We just didn't call it a hydrolysis reaction when we talked about digestion. All this is is breaking down a large molecule into its smaller pieces so that then it can be absorbed across the small intestine into the bloodstream to get everywhere it needs to get. This amino acid will then go to every single cell. The ribosomes that are waiting for them in each cell are going to take these individual amino acids and assimilate them or build them back up into the proteins that your body needs. That process is the condensation process. And we're going to learn more about that. We know that in biology. You know it more specifically, I think, as transcription and translation. But it's an example of a condensation reaction. Oops. <clears throat> so here's another example. These are silkworms. Each of these blocks represent a protein. These proteins make up um, silk. Uh, or, sorry, these monomers together as a polymer make up that protein that we know, know as silk. Okay? Um, and that's where I'm going to leave it. That's condensation hydrolysis. So <clears throat> let me go back to this general model. So in these blue circles, um, we could put um, glucose molecules or monosaccharides and put them together, and we'd end up with starch or cellulose. We could put amino acids together to make a protein. Um, or we could take fatty acids and glycerol and put those together and make fat molecules or phospholipids. Um, whatever the case may be, it's the same process of condensation reactions and hydrolysis reactions. Um, so you need to make sure you understand which, which each word means and what's going on with water, what the products would be of each kind of reaction. Okay, um, And I hope that makes sense to you. Um, if not, jot down questions and we'll talk about it. All right.